All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's about four o'clock. I think we can have this uh, uh, lecture event start. Uh, so first of all, welcome. And good to see uh, people here. And also, I know we have a lot of audience online uh, joining us online as well. Uh, my name is Jing Jing Kim, some of you may know. Uh, I'm associate professor from Department of Biological Science at DePaul, and I serve as a chair of a William J. DeGutis Women in Science and the House Lecture Committee. Uh, I'm very excited to see everybody here as our third annual event. Uh, this year, we have over 150 people registered for, for the event. Uh, some are here in person and a lot more are joining us online. So I want to remind people uh, who are joining us online that uh, you may ask questions at any time through typing your questions um, in the chat function. Uh, and for our audience who are sitting here in person, you may uh, ask questions anytime directly. Uh, and another thing I want to remind you is that this uh, event, uh, this lecture is going to be recorded and the, the recording is going to be posted online uh, at the DePaul's uh, uh, CSH YouTube channel. Okay, so uh, it's going to be ready. Uh, we will let you know when it's ready. So today we will begin the, the program by welcoming remarks uh, by Provost of uh, DePaul University, Dr. Sama Aganem. Dr. Sama Aganem uh, became Provost of DePaul in 2021 after serving as interim and uh, acting Provost. Prior to that, she was Professor and the Dean for the College of Communication. Uh, we are very glad to have her here. We know that she has a very busy schedule, but she managed to, to, to come here to join us for, for this uh, lecture. So now I will turn over the podium to uh, Provost Ganem for welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kit. And good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us today for the third annual William J. Dugotas Women in Science and Health Lecture Series. We're very grateful to our alumnus uh, sponsor, Dr. Linda Dugotas, who so generously made this lecture series possible. And I would like to extend a special thank you to Dr. Francesca Duncan, the Thomas J. Watkins Memorial Professor of Reproductive Science and co-director of the Center for for Reproductive Science at Northwestern University for serving as this year's keynote speaker. Thank you for being here. Your research, investigating female reproductive aging and its effects on fertility and general health, not only direct, directly addresses an issue that affects all women, but your work as a scientist is a true inspiration for women pursuing careers in science. And thank you for sharing your experience and knowledge with us today. For 125 years, DePaul has served a diverse community of learners. Here we embrace our differences, we support one another, and we're always looking for ways to do more. And that's why this lecture series was created, to encourage and support our female students as they pursue careers in science and health-related fields. Because as we all know, we have far too few women represented in STEM. And better representation is not only good for women, but good for the fields they work in and the individuals and the communities they serve. And it's certainly an exciting time for the College of Science and Health. For this fall, we introduced a new master's program in occupational therapy and relaunched the bachelor's in nursing program. So thank you, Stephanie, for making that happen. And just last month, we cut the ribbon on a new standalone space for the neuroscience program on the Lincoln Park campus. And we have Dorothy Kozlowski with us here today. Um, so a lot of these 
programs that are happening in the College of Science and Health are really creating new opportunities for our students that directly meet societal and workforce demands. And the growth in this area and the college is necessary and really exciting. Thank you to our faculty and staff in the College of Science and Health for all that you do every single day for our students. From hands-on learning in the lab to lecture programs like this one, the mentorship you offer our students is invaluable. And a special thank you goes to the committee who helped organize today's program, including Jing Jang Kip, who serves as chair, Susan McMahon, Dorothy Kozlowski, Bernhard Beck Winchats, Blair Janus, and Jolene Arntley, and Damian Rodriguez. And I want to thank, special thank you to Dean Stephanie Dance Barnes for her continued support of this program. We all look forward to next year's Women in Science and Health Lecture. And thank you very much, and please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ganem, for the inspiring and encouraging remarks. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Stephanie Dansbars, Dean of a College of Science and Health, will give introduction to the William J. DeGutis Women in Science and Health Lecture. Uh, Dr. Dansbars is an expert in cell biology and the STEM education. She has been serving as a Dean of uh, CSH since 2020. Uh, now, Dean Benzwar. Hello. I just want to, uh, once again, uh, well, Selma's gone, but I very much want to thank her for um, joining us today. And I definitely want to echo her sentiments and also welcome every one of you to this third annual William, William J. J. DeGutis Women in Science and Health Lecture Series. And it is now, of course, as we see a signature event sponsored by our college. And uh, it would, and I would also like to also welcome our speaker, Dr. Francesca Duncan. And um, as I was kind of preparing for today, I was thinking about your topic and then coming off of Women's History Histories Month, which really does honor women. Um, but I was also thinking we're, we're really so old and dynamic and we have to overcome a lot of challenges. And the work that you're, you're doing, it, it does, it speaks to, you know, thinking about reproduction and um, everything that comes along with it. And it got me thinking about my research path before I even got into cancer research. And um, I'm, I was a non-traditional student. I took a gap year at the undergrad. And my work looked at the neuroprotective effects of estrogen um, on menopause and the impacts on cognition. And so I just think about that as women, all the, so the challenges that we kind of deal with, but the type of work that you're doing um, directly um, speaks to the impact. But the purpose of this lecture series is to promote the accomplishments of women in the natural and health sciences, as well as other closely related fields. And this series provides us with the unique opportunity to create scholarship and community among faculty, students, staff, and the public, while reinforcing the importance of creating an equitable and inclusive environment. And this is also by understanding we're supporting um, women and also acknowledging the valuable innovations, ideas, and, al uh, and alternate perspectives that we bring to the table. The lecture series is very much about legacy and the legacy of this university, the college, the faculty, the staff, and our students, and how we play a vital role in fulfilling the, the mission, especially the many inspirational women that continue to pave the way to excellence. One such woman is Dr. Linda DeGudis, um, who we'll hear from later. And it has been clear to me what she believes um, 
her father's legacy to be, which was the inspiration for this. And if you are unfamiliar with Linda's father, William J. DeGudis, who was a World War II veteran who worked at Ford Motor Company and for the U U.S. Department of the Interior and Federal Water Pollution Control Administration for many years, where he played a role in protecting our waterways. But what I have learned from Linda was that he instilled in her the love and passion for science and public service. And it is that passion and love for science and service that's brought us here today. Linda, like her father, wants to ensure that the longstanding issue of the lack of representation of women in STEM addressed by, uh, is addressed by creating a sustained platform that encourages participation and highlights the successful research and service achievements of women in STEM careers. And also, um, we're fortunate that um, this opportunity has come in the form of this impactful lecture series. Linda is indeed a proud alum and nationally recognized leader for her policy advocacy and her work on initiatives focusing on prevention of violence and injury in addition to suicide prevention and intervention. She's an outstanding example of the caliber of graduate, um, graduates that the, that the College of Science and Health produces. Our graduates have the distinction of ascension character, where they are uniquely equipped to engage, innovate, and make discoveries in science and health to serve or in service to others. I know um, people have heard me say this before about our graduates, but we are truly equipping them with the confidence to ask the hard questions and to be able to em empathize with people whose experiences and perspectives may be different from their own and to test those ideas with sci science and rigor and trust that the diverse minds working together have the ability to arrive at more creative solutions. So I, I, I want to end today um, by emphasize, emphasizing the importance again of why we're here. And that is to continue to acknowledge the legacy of William J. DeGudis and the sustained impact that he has had on Linda and through the reach of this lecture series, ultimately the impact it has on the many other women in science as well. And once again, I want to thank our speaker for being here today. I want to repeat what Salma said earlier and thank the committee that and all others that help uh, pull this together. And um, I, I find it an honor to stand up here and greet all of you and be a part of this event today as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Densmars. That was a, a wonderful speech. And uh, it's very motivating to hear about the story of uh, Dr. Linda DeGutis and her father, Mr. William uh, DeGutis. So as mentioned by the provost and by the dean, uh, that one of the purposes of this lecture series is to promote the accomplishments of women in the natural and the health sciences. So we will hear more about the accomplishments of our today's keynote speaker a little bit later. Uh, before that, I would also like to invite Dr. Dorothy Koslowski to come here to highlight the accomplishments of some of our female students uh, in the college. Uh, Dr. Koslowski is a Vincent DePaul Professor in Neuroscience and Biology. She was the interim, uh, interim dean of a CSH from uh, 19, uh, 2019 to 2020 and uh, uh, played an important role in helping setting up this uh, uh, lecture series, and she also created the neuroscience program, as a, uh, the provost mentioned earlier, and the currently serve as a director of the neuroscience program. Uh, Dr. Kaslaski. Okay, well, I am here to um, acknowledge not the speaker, not the faculty. Sorry, you've already had your fun. <laughs> Uh, but some students. So the College of Science and Health offers scholarships to support the advancement of women in STEM and health uh, for a number of years. And these scholarships have been around for a while. Um, there's the Conforti 
Scholarship endowed by Fred and Leona Conforti, and the Lippitt Scholarship endowed by Margaret O'Malley Lippitt. And the purpose of these two scholarships are to encourage female students to um, enroll in and excel in science, math, and health, and also to increase the diversity of the student population in the sciences um, at DePaul. Um, and so today, I'm excited to announce the awardees. Uh, they already know, so, but this is just to let you all know who they are. Um, so the O'Malley Lippitt Scholarship um, has been awarded to Elizabeth Miller, who was a ju uh, junior studying biochemistry. If you're here, look, oh, there you are, in the flesh. And then the um, Conforti Scholarship this year has been awarded to Gia Valdez, who is a senior studying neuroscience and psychology. Is Gia here? No, but that's Gia. Okay, so um, obviously, you know, these aren't the only two females who excel <laughs> in terms of science at DePaul. Uh, but uh, these are two scholarships that have been created to ensure that females are supported. So thank you to you all and also congratulations to these young women. Thank you, Dr. Koslowski, and uh, congratulations again to the awardees. Uh, next, we're going to move on to today's uh, keynote address by our guest speaker. But before she starts that, I'd be happy and very excited to give you a brief introduction of our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Francesca Duncan. I have known her for probably a decade or more now uh, through my participation of the Center for Reproductive uh, Science Activities at Northwestern. That's where I received my postdoctoral training. Uh, Dr. Duncan received her BS degree from a Harvard Ford College in Pennsylvania. And then she received her PhD degree in cell and molecular biology from the University of uh, Pennsylvania and then completed her postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Pennsylvania and also at Northwestern University. Uh, by the way, we had a student meet professor session just prior to this lecture. Some students were there. We got a lot of insider stories from her. It was very fun, very inspiring. So I you know, encouraged for those who didn't get to attend that session to talk to her during the reception get some stories <laughs> from her. It's very interesting to see her uh, past in terms of why she chose to do a BS there and the PhD here and the uh, fellowship there. So uh, anyway, it's very uh, a very good story for a career path if you're thinking about where to go as a student. So she, uh, Dr. Duncan is currently an associate professor in the Department of, 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 of Obstetrics and uh, gynecology in Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern, uh, where she's the co-director of the Center for Reproductive Science and holds the Thomas Watkins Memorial Professorship. She's also an associate professor in residence at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. And Dr. Duncan leads a very productive research program that studies the mechanisms of how aging impacts reproductive potential in the gamete and the ovary. And her research is funded by uh, National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Health. Uh, and again, during the student meet professor session, we talked about how big her lab is and uh, she received a lot of funding this, uh, uh, these years and uh, uh, recruited a lot of students and trainings and uh, uh, research uh, of, uh, members for her lab. And recently, Dr. Duncan has expanded her research to identify novel targets for non-hormonal contraception in the ovary. And in 2020, she received an $8 million four-year grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for this line of work. And i also like to mention that most recently, uh, she led an effort, a multi-institutional effort, to submit a NIH grant uh, to fund a new annual conference, which is called the Upper Midwest Summit for Reproductive Science. 
So this conference will, will unite reproductive research and medicine across 16 institutions in five state, uh, states. And uh, this uh, grant received a perfect impact for, uh, factor and it was ranked in the first percent uh, for, <coughs> after reviewing. So which is uh, really impressive. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be funded and I really look forward to the first conference which is going to be held in October. Uh, Dr. Duncan has co-authored over 90 manuscripts and her work has been highlighted on BBC Radio, in Discover Magazine, Marie Claire Magazine, and CNN uh, House. And she's also a reviewer for over 30 journals and have served on numerous editorial boards. She's currently the deputy editor-in-chief of Molecular Human Reproduction. Uh, Dr. Duncan has received many honors and awards, including a 2017 United States uh, Fulbright Award and the 2019 uh, Varendra Mahesh New Investigator Award from the Society for the Study of Reproduction. So today, uh, the title of her talk, as you can see from the slide, uh, which is uh, Modulating Female Reproductive Function Across the Lifespan. Uh, without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Uh, Francesca Duncan to the public. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Kip, for that um, really warm introduction and um, to the entire group here. Um, thank you. I want to, again, acknowledge um, the committee um, for the invitation and also Dr. DeGutis, um to give this lectureship in honor of her father. So um, today I will be, I, I made my title here, Modulating Female Reproductive Function Across the Lifespan, because that's, as you've heard, part of my lab works on contraceptive development, but also uh, part of my lab really studies on reproductive aging. Um, and I realized as I was putting this talk together that we'd be here for a very long time if I tried to cover everything. And so I am going to focus the work that we are have been doing on reproductive longevity. Um, but if people are interested in the contraceptive aspect, I'm happy to talk about that further um, in the reception. So in terms of an overview, I'm going to start with um, some background on female reproductive aging and why this matters. And then the work that we've been doing in the aging ovarian microenvironment and the biological consequences. Um, and this actually was a, turns out, and I'll tell the story, um, was a serendipitous observation in the lab. It was actually sort of a lemon and the lump that we've been trying to turn into lemonade, um, but it's become very sort of impactful. And then I'll tell you about therapeutic interventions and tools uh, to be able to study the ovarian microenvironment um, and finally end with some future perspectives. So I've been really interested in female reproductive aging because the female reproductive system is really the first to show overt signs of aging in the human body. And you can appreciate that here in this graph, um, which shows tissue performance percentage across tissues um, across age. And what you can appreciate in the blue lines is that really all tissues with age deteriorate with function. But what you can also see is that red line, which highlights female reproductive function. And what you'll see is that that red line really declines much earlier and more drastically relative to those blue lines. So female fertility will begin to decline in women in their mid 30s and reproductive function will cease completely at the time of menopause when women are around age 50. So a clinician in our field once said, quote, the ovaries are probably the only organs whose peak potential is reached long before their first use. So I thought that was a very sobering concept and it was something that I really wanted to understand more about. So in the ovary, um, reproductive aging is really characterized by two main events. First, there's a loss in the number of follicles that are within the ovary, and that's shown here in this red line. So females are born with a, a fixed number of follicles, and those winnow across the reproductive lifespan. And you can see that quite nicely um, in these histological sections of human ovaries. On the top is a seven-year-old ovary, and all those little circles are follicles with eggs. And so you can see there's clearly a lot of those follicles. But if you look already at a 29-year-old ovary, there's much fewer of those follicles left in the ovary. At the same time that you have this loss of the number of follicles in the ovary, you also have a decrease in their quality. And that's shown in this blue line here 
as an increased fraction of poor quality oocytes. Now, of course, we're talking about aging, but we also know that there are various other factors that can contribute to this accelerated ovarian aging. So there's certainly um, underlying genetic conditions. There's also underlying conditions like diabetes and obesity that can change the trajectory of ovarian aging. External factors um, like smoking, environmental exposure, stress, um, and also, for example, chemotherapy and radiation. So reproductive aging has significant clinical ramifications. We know that women of advanced reproductive age are at a higher risk of infertility and spontaneous abortion. And those women who are able to conceive are at a higher risk of dizygotic twinning, obstetrical complications, as well as birth defects. And this is a societal um, concern um, because we know that globally, this is data from the United States, but we know that globally women are delaying childbearing. And you can see that in this graph, again, this is CDC data from the US, that um, in the populations of 30 to 34, 35 to 39, and 40 to 44, uh, those are the ages that are increasing in terms of, of age at first uh, birth. But it's not just about fertility. So we know that reproductive aging has general health consequences because as these follicles grow in the ovary, they're producing gonadal hormones like we just heard from your dean um, with estrogen, which can have really important uh, ramifications on the function of downstream organ systems. So we know that, for example, estrogen uh, regulates cardiovascular health, cognitive health, immune health, and sexual health. So with age, when we're losing follicles and we're losing estrogen, we also have this broad uh, scope of general health effects. And so while we don't think about menopause as a pathology, it's part of our normal physiology, really we've changed the way we're living because the age of menopause has stayed constant pretty much for, the, for as far back as we can look. However, with medical interventions, um, our life expectancy has increased significantly. So what you can see in that gray area is that more and more women are gonna be living longer in an altered endocrine state and uh, realize these uh, health ramifications of reproductive aging. And in fact, we know that there is an association between menopause and lifespan. So this is an epidemiologic data that shows that women who undergo menopause at a later age have an actually longer uh, lifespan. So there really is a need to understand uh, reproductive aging and its mechanisms. And so this is somewhat reframing the, the way that the field uh, thinks about research on aging and longevity. So for a while, um, the, the goal in aging research was to expand our lifespan, so to live longer. And then people started to say, well, we don't want to live longer in an unhealthy state. And so the field really changed the paradigm to start thinking about health span. So extending the, the healthy years of your life. So we have lifespan and health span. And what I want to put forth here is that when we're talking about women and females, we have to consider reproductive span as a part of health span. So in order to extend health span, we also need to be able to extend reproductive span for both fertility and endocrine function. So again, there's really a drive to understand what are the mechanisms that underlie this reproductive aging. And so data from assisted reproductive technologies has demonstrated quite clearly that when we look at the age associated decline in fertility, the defect in the egg is very important. And so I'll walk you through this graph, which really highlights this concept. So what this graph is showing is um, the percentage of fresh embryo transfers that result in live offspring in women who are undergoing assisted reproductive technology in two cohorts of women, those who've used their own eggs to conceive, and that's shown in the dashed line, and those who've used donor eggs to conceive. So donor eggs are typically from young, healthy women in their 20s. And this is plotted against age. And so what you'll see really clearly if you look at that dashed line is that if a woman uses her own eggs to conceive, there's a sharp maternal age effect, such that a woman in her 40s has a really low chance of taking home a live offspring if she undergoes assisted reproductive technology. But if a woman uses a donor egg to conceive, that maternal age effect is essentially abrogated. So what this data tells us is that the biological age of the egg is really critical in dictating reproductive outcomes. 
And so it's not surprising that when we look at sort of the research focus on trying to understand what are the mechanisms of reproductive aging, a lot of that has focused on what is happening, what are the changes that are happening intrinsic to that oocyte, um, and what are changing with age. And so there has been quite a bit of research over the past 20 years to identify these mechanisms. And what I'm putting here on this slide is that we actually do know quite a lot. Um, we know that there's changes in the organelles and structures. Um, for example, there's a lot of work done on chromosome segregation. We know that during meiosis with age, there are errors that take place and lead to conditions like trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. We also know that mitochondria, the energy producing organelles of the cell, become defective with age um, and that compromises the quality of that gamete. Um, and so forth, you can see there's a lot of pathways that have also been implicated in this process. But when I um, started my lab, and I'll, I'll tell the story, um, we made this serendipitous discovery. And, and again, I was an egg biologist. I was really focused on the egg. Everyone called me sort of eccentric in that way. Um, but we started to think a little bit more broadly and shifted the perspective of female reproductive aging to the concept that it's not just the egg. And if you remember nothing about my talk today, I hope you will just walk away with this image, um, which is that in order to make a good quality egg, of course the egg has to be good, right? And that egg is sitting in the nest. But it's really important that the nest is also good. If that nest is compromised, that will also compromise the quality of the egg. And so we started thinking about the microenvironment in which this egg is developing and how does that change with age. Now that's not such a crazy concept if you think about cancer biology where really the tumor microenvironment is informing what the behavior is of those cancer cells. But this concept really had not been applied to the ovary and ovarian aging. So this is the first observation in the lab that made us start to think about the ovarian environment. And so I, I realize that not everyone here looks at ovaries every day, so I'll walk you through what you're seeing. Um, and I'll do my best to walk you through all of the data and show you the take home points. But what you can see here um, are histological sections of mouse ovaries. On the left is one that's from a reproductively young animal, so six to 12 weeks of age. And on the, on the right here is a reproductively old animal. It's a 14 to 17 month old animal, which would be equivalent to a woman in her late 30s or early 40s. And the circular structures that you see are the ovarian follicles. So can anyone tell me here what they see? What are different about these ovaries? Not a trick question. Um, see a lot more of the um, circular aspects in the younger one rather than the older one. Absolutely. So there are fewer follicles in the old ovary compared to the young. And as I told you, that's a hallmark of ovarian aging that you lose these follicles. Um, and that's exactly the case. However, there still are follicles present, right? Like, so you can see there's still those circular structures. And when I started my lab, what I was really interested in was looking at the um, structures, the really small follicles there that are highlighted in that red box, um, because I thought that a lot of the work had been done on sort of mature oocytes or gametes before ovulation. But I wanted to look earlier in development because I figured earlier in development, uh, if there are problems there that are happening with age, that would then impact later on uh, the quality of that egg. And so our goal was to actually isolate these follicles from the ovary and we wanted to perform RNA-seq um, to look at transcriptomic profiling. And the way we isolate these follicles is using insulin needles. So we just dissect the ovaries and with this mechanical force. And I have here the observation that was made by um, several people in the lab, which they came to me and they said, you know, every time we try to isolate the follicles from the old ovaries, it's really hard to get these follicles out of the tissue. And so I kept that in the back of my head um, because again, if everyone is making this observation, there's probably something to that. But nevertheless, we were actually able to isolate these follicles. Again, those are the structures in, that I had highlighted in the red boxes. And you can see they're young, the, on the left is from young animals, on the right is from old animals. And you can see that they are morphologically indistinct. Um, but we went ahead and we performed transcriptomic profiling. And what we see based on principal components is that we can separate the follicles based on the age of the animals. So blue and purple are follicles from old animals and red, orange, green, and yellow are from young animals. So this tells us that the transcriptomic signatures are quite different with age of the animal. 
And it turns out that one of the most predominant signatures with age is this inflammatory uh, shift in gene expression. So this heat map is just showing um, various different uh, genes are involved in inflammatory pathways. And all of those that you see are, so red is higher expression, blue is lower expression. And it turns out that all of those columns that you see in red are from follicles from old animals. So this really tells us that the aging uh, follicle becomes very inflammatory. So I started to think about everything together. We're having these follicles, they have this inflammatory gene expression signature. It's really hard to get them out of that tissue. What's going on? And so we started thinking about the concept of inflammation and fibrosis. So aging um, is associated with a chronic progressive um, state, pro-inflammatory state, and this is happening in the absence of any overt infection. And so this is common in many aging tissues and it's termed inflammaging. So inflammation um, and aging together are also associated with fibrosis. And again, this happens in many organs um, in the body with age. And this fibrosis really refers to the excess deposition of extracellular matrix, specifically collagen. So again, these are common aging phenotypes, but remember the ovaries aging much earlier relative to these other organ systems. So if this inflammation and fibrosis is not effectively resolved, it can lead to tissue damage and homeostatic dysregulation and become problematic for the function of that tissue. And so we asked really the simple question, is inflammation and fibrosis happening in the aging ovarian microenvironment? And at the time I had a lab that was very close to pharmacology where they were studying liver fibrosis and toxicology and had a lot of really good tools to be able to study inflammation and fibrosis. And so what we did was we looked at young and old ovaries and looked at gene expression. And what you can see here, these are several pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, the data for the young and the data for the old. And what you can see is that across the board, there are higher levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the old ovaries compared to the young. So data for the transcripts are shown on the left and on the right, you can see that there's also proteins that are secreted or produced by the old ovaries that are also highly pro-inflammatory with IL-6 being a major driver of inflammation. We also see really unique structures in the ovary. And this was an observation that an undergraduate student made in the lab um, when he was counting follicles in, in the ovaries for us. And he came to me and he said, Francesca, there are always these clusters of brown cells and they're always present in the old ovaries, but they're never present in the young ovaries. And I hope you can appreciate that there, that there are those brown staining clusters of cells. And so we went back into the literature and into just the general literature to figure out what these might be. And it turns out that they're multinucleated macrophage giant cells, which are a unique population of immune cells that are always present in tissues where there's chronic inflammation. Um, and so we confirm that these are in fact macrophages and they're multinucleated. Um, and again, so this really is confirmatory that the aging ovary is a highly inflammatory um, environment. So inflammation typically precedes fibrosis, um, and again, excess deposition of collagen. And so we used a histological stain to detect fibrosis. This is called picroserious red. It detects collagen one and three. And so what I want you to see on these slides, these are pictures of ovaries from animals of different ages, from five months all the way to 22 months. And the darker the red stain, that's more fibrotic tissue or more collagen. And so, again, I hope you'll appreciate that you can see that there are these foci of fibrotic tissue that expand throughout the ovary such that the time the animal is about two years of age, about 35% of that tissue is like this dense collagen tissue. And we also confirm this histological uh, assay using a biochemical assay that you can see in this graph bar graph here, where we're measuring the level of hydroxylated collagen um, or proline on collagen um, and that gives you an, a readout of the collagen levels. And what you can see is that there's significantly more collagen in that old ovary compared to the young ovary. We've also done proteomic studies. So again, we were targeting our uh, observations by looking at known candidates of inflammation and fibrosis, but we've also done uh, unbiased proteomics to look to see what proteins are changing with age. And so when we do this with young and old ovaries, we can see that they separate based on their proteomics profile dependent on age. There are 180 different proteins that are altered with age. 
And what you'll see in this uh, uh, pathway analysis is that there are many proteins that are involved in extracellular matrix organization, um, as well as the immune response and inflammatory response. And so again, we're very convinced that the aging ovary, the environment is quite different um, with age. And so again, we, we study most of our work is done in the mouse model. We study mammalian uh, ovarian biology, but when possible, we always try to translate our work into uh, human samples just to make sure we're not studying a mouse specific effect. And so what you can see is that this age dependent fibroinflammatory signature is highly conserved in the human. So on the left, what you can see, these are fibroinflammatory cytokines that are measured in human follicular fluid, which is another environment um, of the ovary. And you can see that with these six uh, cytokines that there's a significant increase with age. We also have done a tissue microarray where we've looked at over 60 participant samples ranging in age from one years old all the way to 58 years old. This is just looking at a few of those cores on that microarray of human ovarian tissue. And you can see here that the collagen is also increasing um, in the human ovary. So what is the impact of having all of this collagen in the ovary? As I told you, the people in my lab were saying it's hard to dissect out these follicles. It's very consistent with the fact that you have fibrotic tissue, but how do you actually quantify that? And so we worked with um, some biophysicists uh, to use a, uh, with several biophysicists to use technology called instrumental indentation, which allows us to quantify the biomechanical properties of the tissue. And so what we do is we take the ovaries out and we are using a probe to measure the force required to push or indent a tissue a given distance. So if an organ is stiffer, it's gonna take more force to indent that tissue. And so what you can see when we do that with young and old ovaries is that it takes more force to push on an old ovary than a young ovary, consistent again with this increase in tissue stiffness and fibrosis. But we wanted to do the experiment to actually show that this collagen was driving this biomechanical property. And so what you can see here, we did uh, the ex vivo assay where we treated old ovaries with collagenase to break down that collagen content of the ovary. And so I hope what you can appreciate just from the histological stain is we have a young ovary, the old ovary has more collagen, but if we treat the old ovary with collagenase, we actually reduce it so it looks much more similar to a young ovary. And now when we go and do our biochemical or biomechanical assay here, what you see is that the young ovary takes less force to indent than the old ovary, but now when we treat the old ovary with collagenase, it has a biomechanical property that's much more similar to the young ovary. So we've effectively rejuvenated that ovary in terms of its biomechanical properties. So one of the biggest questions is, well, who cares? So with age, you have this stiffer ovary. And so, uh, and people asked me these questions when I first started my lab and I would go present this, this work and they were like, great, who cares? And so those questions and ideas that were brought to us have really kind of guided us into thinking, what are the consequences? And so what I'm gonna show you in the next few slides are where we, why we think that this is important biologically. So one thing we think of is that that stiffness of that environment of that ovary, that stiff environment actually negatively impacts the developmental capacity of the eggs and the follicles within that ovary. And the way we've been able to show that is by actually using an in vitro assay where we can take follicles out of the ovary. You can see those are all isolated follicles from a mouse ovary. And we can encapsulate them in alginate hydrogels. Um, and so alginate is a naturally occurring biomaterial and it's nice because you can tweak the stiffness of the environment by changing the percentage of alginate. So a higher concentration of alginate is going to lead to a stiffer gel um, and a lower concentration is going to lead to a less stiff gel. And so I can tell you that um, an old ovary has an equivalent stiffness to about 1.5 to 2% alginate. Um, and what you can see here, these are um, looking at, uh, these graphs are looking at uh, the follicle growth curves for those grown in different percentages of alginate going from more stiff to less stiff. And what you can see is that in the stiffer gel, uh, the growth of these follicles is significantly um, diminished. So you can see that in that, the square line or the squares there, that's the lowest uh, follicle growth. So these follicles that are grown in the stiff gels are also not functional. So they 
Normally, follicles are going to produce estradiol, and you see that that is very low um, in those stiffer gels. And then importantly, when we grow follicles in these stiff gels, we recover the eggs that are resulting from these follicles, and we perform IVF. What you can see is that the higher the stiffness, the lower the percentage of two cell embryos. Um, and there's a box there but basically the, the, uh, that's covering it, but basically the softer the gel, the higher the percentage of embryo development. So we think that the stiffer environment of the aging ovary negatively impacts follicles in terms of their ability to grow, but also to be functional and produce high quality eggs that can be fertilized. We also, uh, think that this aging environment may contribute to ovulatory dysfunction. So you can imagine every cycle um, there's a release of an egg, so that follicle has to rupture and release the egg, and that requires the ability to break down the matrix and also to undergo a, a remodeling or wound healing process. So if you have a lot of fibrosis and stiffness, that can actually physically <coughs> block ovulation from taking place. And so what we did was we took ovaries from young and old mice and we can actually induce ovulation to happen. And this is looking at the collagen stain after ovulation. And what you can see is that just like in the native ovary that was not stimulated to ovulate, after ovulation we see a lot of collagen still in that old ovary. Um, and so this tells us, and, and these are also uh, structures that have ovulated, there's lots of collagen there. So that um, is really consistent with this fact that there might be an alteration in that physical environment that might be impacting ovulation. And so we looked at this more closely. Um, this is looking at a time course of ovulation um, in young and old animals. And this is an example of a follicle that's ready, getting ready to ovulate. So normally when we induce ovulation, it takes about 12 hours for the structure to expand and rupture. And so what we're looking at here is zero, four, and eight hours um, after induction of ovulation. So in the young follicle, you can see that over time, it's expanding, it's accumulating fluid, it's getting ready to rupture. And if you look in the purple bars, that's looking at the young animal, you can see that this follicular area is increasing. But in our old animal, these follicles are not expanding to the same extent. And you can see that in the gray bars where you don't see that increase. And so again, if you have fibrosis and physical restriction, this is what you would predict, that these structures would not be able to get as big. So we then looked to see what was happening in terms of ovulation. So in ovulation, you have these large follicles in the ovary, you induce ovulation, they're going to rupture from that follicular structure, and they're going to end up in the fallopian tube. Um, and in the mouse, uh, the fallopian tube is called uh, the oviduct, and the part of the oviduct where these are captured is called the ampulla. So what we measured, we induced ovulation, and then at 0, 11, 12, and 13 hours, we collected these cumulus oocyte complexes, these eggs, and we look to see are they in the ovary, meaning they haven't ovulated, or are they in the ampulla, meaning they have ovulated. And what you can see on the left is the data in the black. This is for young animals. What you can see is that there is this nice uh, reduction of, of eggs in the ovary with the time course of ovulation, so that black line they're going down. But instead, they're appearing, there's an increase in that white bar um, because they're appearing in the oviduct. So that's telling us that ovulation is happening. If we look at the same trajectory in the old animals, what we see is that that's very muted. So ovulation is happening. We do see some oocytes or eggs appearing in the oviduct, but it's definitely not happening to the same extent. So there's two possibilities here. One is that it's just the process is delayed, or the other alternative is that the process is not happening at all. And it turns out that it might be both, but we do have evidence that there is actually ovulatory dysfunction with age. So as I mentioned, the eggs should be released and they should be found in the fallopian tube or oviduct. But what we wanted to see was whether or not there was evidence of completely failed ovulation. And the way we do that is we can look at two different phenotypes in the histology. One is that we look at a um, what's called an oocyte that's trapped in an unruptured follicle that has started to undergo the luteinization process. So everyone sees here there's an oocyte that's stuck in the middle of that structure. That should have been released. So we can count those. We can also count at a certain time point these follicles that should have ruptured but have not yet ruptured at this time. And so we see that they have expanded, there's an oocyte, but they haven't actually released that oocyte. 
And what we see with age is that there is a significant increase um, in these uh, uh, evidence of, of unruptured uh, follicles. Um, and at the same time, we know that there's fewer eggs that are ovulated with age. So there's clearly ovulatory dysfunction um, that's happening, and we think in, potentially in part due to this fibrosis. So in addition to having uh, uh, issues with ovulation, so obviously the, the follicle has to rupture, but once the rupture event takes place, it also, there has to be a wound healing process. Um, and so there's a lot of remodeling that happens. And you would imagine that if you had this fibrotic tissue, that it would be very difficult for this tissue uh, to reform. And in fact, this is the case. And so we can look at the ovarian surface epithelium. These are the cells that cover the ovary. And what you can see is that at sites of uh, follicular rupture, there is a loss of that epithelial layer. And so what we did was we quantified with this brown stain, this is marking the ovarian surface epithelium, um, what happened in young and old ovaries. And what you can see is that um, with two different markers of the ovarian surface epithelium, there's less of that remodeling happening in our old ovaries relative to our young ovaries. And in fact, there's a quite a significant difference in the ovarian surface epithelium with age. We see that with age, there's a thickening of that ovarian surface epithelium, um, and there are also these uh, protrusions or outgrowths that are taking place. And we don't quite understand the significance of that, but there's clearly differences in terms of the ability for these structures to remodel correctly. And we've also been able to show this in vitro. So we can actually take pieces of ovarian tissue and we can cut them. Um, and we can encapsulate them in those alginate hydrogels that I told you about that we could also use for follicles. And what happens is if you take these pieces of tissue and you put them in these alginate hydrogels, is that over different days in culture, you reform that ovarian surface epithelium. So if you see that brown stain, you can see that, again, that ovary is undergoing this wound healing process and forming this coating. And so we wondered whether or not we would predict that if this process truly, this wound healing ability was compromised, that this ovarian surface epithelium wouldn't reform as well if we compared young ovary or old ovaries to young ovaries. And so this is what we did. We took pieces of ovaries. This is a young ovary on the left, old ovary on the right. Um, and you can see on the brown stain, that's the ovarian surface epithelium. We've clearly cut these ovaries, so part of it is wounded. Um, and you can see that the percent of the area of that tissue that's encapsulated by the ovarian surface epithelium at the beginning is similar in young and old. However, by day eight of culture, what you can see is that the young ovary is able to reform most of that ovarian surface epithelium, that brown stain, but you see that that's significantly compromised um, with age. So we think that this physical environment of the ovary is changing, and again, it has ramifications for follicular development, ovulation, and wound healing. Um, but the final thing that we think is really important is the intersection between ovarian aging and cancer. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, ovarian cancer is one of the most lethal form of cancer in women. Um, and it's typically most frequently diagnosed in postmenopausal women. So median age of diagnosis of around 63. So postmenopausal uh, women. And we know in these postmenopausal women that essentially the entire ovary is, is a dense collagen uh, fibrotic matrix. And that's an example of a collagen stain in a 63 year old individual. And um, uh, Joanna Burdett's group at UIC has shown really quite nicely that ovarian cancer cells um, or oviductal, mouse oviductal epithelial cells prefer to uh, colonize collagen matrix matrices relative to the ovarian surface epithelium or ovarian stromal cells. And so this gave us this, this thought that perhaps this aging ovarian microenvironment that is very fibrotic and collagen dense may actually serve a really important niche for ovarian cancer cells. And also another point that I just want to to draw here is that the failure of that ovarian surface epithelium to reform may actually facilitate the entry of cancer cells because ovarian cancer originates from the fallopian tube. So if you have during this period of ovulation a failure to reform that ovarian surface epithelium, that may actually uh, allow cancer cells to enter and then colonize on this collagen-rich uh, matrix. 
And interestingly, the fiber structure of collagen is really important for cancer. So you can see here, this is looking at the, the structure of the collagen fibers in a normal um, individual and an individual with ovarian, high-grade ovarian uh, cancer. And you can see that these collagen fibers elongate um, quite extensively in the cancer setting. And if we look at the structure of what's happening to the aging ovary, this is human data, you can see that with advanced reproductive age, we also have lengthening of these collagen fibers, again, supporting this idea that this environment may be permissive to these cancer cells. And so we can perform an ex vivo adhesion assay. So we can take ovarian cancer cells and we can incubate them with um, tissues and we can see, look at, look at the adherence. And what you can see here, this is a young ovary and an old ovary and we have um, ovarian cancer cells that are tagged with the fluorescent protein, um, red fluorescent protein, so they appear red. What you can see here is that cancer cells uh, are preferentially adhering to our old ovaries relative to the young ovaries. And this seems to be important, not just sort of the cellular compartment of the ovary, because if we just isolate the ovarian stromal cells, so we remove the extracellular matrix, we don't see this increase in adherence. So this tells us that this cancer cell adhesion is probably requiring some sort of extracellular matrix factors. Um, and in fact, with our proteomics, we're pretty excited about this. I showed you some of our proteomics in the beginning. What you can see here, these are proteins that are involved, that are increased with age in the ovary, that are involved in extracellular matrix organization, wound healing, and um, fibroblast stimulation. Um, and these have all been implicated in ovarian cancer, but they haven't, the link between ovarian cancer and the aging ovary have not been made. And so we're really excited to be able to start these mechanistic studies that are really gonna bring together the fields of aging, cancer, and reproductive biology. So, as I said, we have this aging ovary. It becomes fibrotic and inflammatory. We think it has consequences in terms of the biology of the follicle, ovulation, and potentially ovarian cancer. And so part of my lab is trying to work on therapeutics. So the concept here is can we use anti-fibrotic anti agents as a therapy um, to modulate and extend reproductive longevity? So this is work that has been done by a postdoc in my lab where she's taken anti-fibrotic drugs, this is the concept here, we would begin to, to treat animals at seven months of age where we know this fibrosis starts happening in the ovary. And our idea would be that these anti-fibrotics would uh, maintain a homeostatic environment um, relative to an animal that doesn't have this treatment that would have high levels of fibrosis and reproductive aging. And so we've established a preclinical model to test the efficacy of these drugs in delaying reproductive aging and improving health outcomes. And so we've started these studies with a FDA-approved antifibrotic agent. This is called perfinidone. Um, it is, again, a broad-spectrum antifibrotic. It targets TGF-beta-1, um, TGF-beta-3, PDGF, and collagen-1 and 3. And we know that these all increase in the aging ovary. Um, it's been used, or it's clinically used, to treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, and it's also been shown to be functional in mice. Um, and so what I'm going to show you are some of our exciting proof of concept studies, both in vitro and in vivo in the ovary. So I also want to point out that a study just came out uh, late last year by Becky Robker's group in, in Adelaide, where they show that there is precedence for this perfinidone to reverse ovarian fibrosis and restore ovulation. And so again, what you can see here is what I've already showed you is that with age, there's an increase in collagen in the ovary. And they did a very short-term treatment with perfinidone, and they were able to show that that uh, reduces the collagen in the ovary. And you can see here, uh, what they're showing here is the number of ovulations that are taking place in a young animal. Ovulation is taking place normally. In old animals, which are the white bar, uh, there is no ovulation, but if you uh, treat with perfinidone, you actually rescue that ovulation. So that is telling us that this antifibrotic agent can actually rescue um, and restore ovulation. But we were interested in the long-term effects of this drug. So the first thing we did was an in vitro assay. So we took ovarian, uh, ovarian tissue and we isolated primary stromal cells. So these are the cells that make up the microenvironment of the ovary. And we induced a fibrotic phenotype by using the driver TGF beta. And so you can see here um, that with TGF beta, um, we have an increased expression of collagen one. Um, 
so that that suggests that these cells are stimulating sort of a fibrotic response. However, if we you treat these cells with TGF beta and perfenidone, you can see that we restore the collagen levels and bring down that increase in collagen. So that tells us that perfenidone could be um, uh, functioning as this antifibrotic agent in the ovary. So we've then moved on to an in vivo approach. So we want to be able to deliver perfinidone both um, in various mechanisms. And so what we've been using are these mini osmotic pumps, um, which allows us to deliver these drugs to the entire animal systemically. Um, or you can use a catheter um, to deliver the drug specifically to the ovary. Um, and so you can see these are examples of the pump that are implanted, and again, this will be systemic and then targeted to the ovary. So for proof of concept, um, we've used uh, these are non-toxic dyes to see where these uh, delivery systems are actually delivering the drugs. So what you can see, the, the dye is blue. If we're using systemic delivery within a few hours, this is now throughout the animal. So that gives us confidence that we have a good delivery method. If we target delivery to the ovary, we don't see blue in the animal. And that's good because we want to be targeting it to the organ. It shouldn't be spreading to the animal. And in fact, when we take the ovaries out, we only targeted one ovary, not the other. You can see that one ovary is blue and not the other. So this gives us confidence that we can actually deliver the drugs the way we say we are. And so what I want to just show you is some, uh, again, preliminary data uh, that I think is quite promising in this in vivo delivery of perfinidone to animals. And so we started at seven months of age. We implanted pumps, and we so all animals had the pumps. They were either given perfinidone or not, and they were treated for a period of six weeks. At which point, uh, we did we uh, analyzed the animals at six weeks, and then we had another cohort of animals who were allowed to age out for three and a half more months, and they were analyzed at 12 months. And so our question is whether or not this drug actually mitigates um, ovarian fibrosis and whether or not this delays signs of reproductive aging and improves health outcomes. And so we've done this for both systemic and targeted delivery, but we are, um, we've only analyzed the data for systemic conditions so far. So what I can tell you is that the six-week uh, six week treatment of perfinidone does not impact the, the general health outcomes of the animals. So after the six-week treatment, the animals that were either control or perfinidone treated weigh the same. If we look at their estrous cyclicity, which is a readout of their reproductive function, so how well are they cycling, very similar to a menstrual cycle, you'll see that the animals uh, with perfinidone or not perfinidone have the same distribution in terms of the animals that are cycling. Um, and there's no difference when we look at bone mass density between these animals. So overall, there doesn't seem to be any major health effects um, of this drug. But we do have some exciting data in terms of what happens at those animals at 12 months of age. So what you can see, um, interestingly, there is an increase in weight of the perfinidone treated animals. We don't quite know what that means. Um, there's no change in bone mass density. But when we start to look at the estrocyclicity, we see things that are quite promising and exciting. So as I showed you, after six weeks, the animals were fine. But what we see in our control animals, now they're 12 months of age at this point, is that the majority of them are not cycling. And this is what you would expect in an aging animal. But if you look at perfinidone, the opposite is true, where we see the majority of those animals are actually still cycling. So this is telling us that their reproductive function might be improved. And in fact, if we go look at the ovaries and some other reproductive markers, we see, again, the study is ongoing, but we see really encouraging results. So what you can see is the ovary, um, the control animal, again, it's a 12-month-old ovary. There's not much, uh, not many follicles. But you see in the perfinidone uh, treated, these ovaries are large. There's still follicle presence. And I, sh I put these arrows to these structures, which are corpus lutea, which are remnants of ovulation. And you can see there are many of those structures in these ovaries. So suggesting that there is potentially enhanced ovulation um, in these animals. If we look at the collagen, you can see that there is significantly less collagen in the perfinidone treated ovaries compared to the control. And this is what we would expect with an antifibrotic agent. Um, and importantly, when we look at hormone levels, we see um, higher levels of estradiol as well as uh, progesterone. So again, this data is analysis is ongoing, but I think this is really promising in terms of the potential of these types of therapeutics um, to improve reproductive longevity. So as we're developing these uh, potentially therapeutic uh, applications of antifibrotic agents in the context of ovarian aging, 
we have to be able to translate this clinically. So again, everything I've told you right now um, has been done in the mouse. And so what we're doing now is to figure out ways to measure fibrosis or ovarian stiffness in humans. And I think that this is gonna be important not only for a marker of ovarian longevity in a female, but we also know that there's potentially a link between a woman's reproductive health and her overall health. So by understanding uh, this biomarker and how it relates to systemic markers of aging, it might be quite powerful. Also, if we are going to translate these uh, technologies like antifibrotic agents into the population, we need to be able to have tools to measure, or not, to measure whether or not we are being effective. And so what we've been doing is using a technology called shear wave elastography, um, which uses ultrasound, um, ultrasound, ultrasound uh, to measure tissue stiffness. And what's great is that GE has a system, Logic Fortis system, uh, which enables us to measure ovarian stiffness using a, a transvaginal ultrasound. Um, and so we've done these proof of concepts um, in some of our patients who've come through the infertility clinic. And I'm really excited to report that we're actually able to uh, measure ovarian stiffness um, in humans, in, in women. And so what you can see here, this is ultra shear wave elastography um, in two participants. So on the left, this is from a 31 year old and on the right is a 38 year old. And you're seeing the images of the ovary. Um, these are both the right ovaries from these two women. And what you can see is there's that oval structure, that's the ovary, and the black areas, those are the follicles. They're fluid filled, so they appear black on the ultrasound. And so we wanna measure the fibrosis in the ovarian stroma, which is also called the parenchyma. And so that's the area that's not those fluid filled uh, structures. And so this um, system is able to give us high confidence uh, regions of where we can do these measurements. So that's shown in the left of each panel. Uh, so the more yellow or the more white, that would be the area where you'd want to make your measurements. And then the image on the right for each of these panels is actually showing the stiffness measurements. So the more red, um, as you go up in that uh, color scheme, the higher, the higher you go up, the more stiff. And so you can see these circles, this is where these measurements were made. And if you compare the 38 year old to the 31 year old, you see that it's more of an aqua color compared to that royal blue. And so that translates into these measurements of a 19, uh, 19 kilopascals versus 12 kilopascals. So this is telling us that this old ovary is stiffer compared to this younger individual. So we're currently working on a trial to establish the clinical parameters and uh, standard operating procedures to be able to use this technology, um, but also to determine the relationship between stiffness and chronologic age, reproductive age, systemic age, uh, inflammation, as well as fertility outcomes. So in conclusion, um, what I've shown you today is that inflammation and fibrosis are hallmarks of the aging ovary. Um, we know that excess collagen is, again, a hallmark of this fibrosis, and this alters the biomechanical properties of the ovary. Um, and this age-associated increase in ovarian stiffness has implications for gamete quality, ovulation dynamics, and ovarian cancer pathogenesis. And so we're working on looking at ovarian fibrosis and stiffness as therapeutic targets to extend reproductive function as well as longevity and also to pioneer these clinical methods that will help us quantify this ovarian stiffness. So again, this will help us evaluate technologies or therapeutics as they emerge, but also serve as a non-invasive marker of reproductive longevity and health. And so I just want to take uh, two more minutes to just tell you where I think the future is. So everything I told you up to now has been very targeted um, in our approaches, but there are lots of really amazing technologies out there that allow us to look at organs in an unbiased way. And so we're partnering with Jen Gurton's lab at Stowers to perform single cell RNA-seq as well as spatial transcriptomics to really inform our understanding of the ovarian, uh, aging ovarian landscape. And so just as a teaser here, I wanna show you that we're able to get really beautiful single cell RNA-seq data. We're able to identify uh, clusters of cells within young and old ovaries. And what we can see based on these uh, single cell analysis is the population of cells um, change quite significantly with age with a shift towards these immune populations. So now with this kind of data, we can go into um, and understand much more clearly what cell populations are changing um, with age. 
And we can couple this with spatial transcriptomics where we perform slide seeks where we can get um, data at the molecular level at single cell resolution. And you can see that here. Uh, this is sort of the molecular signature in spatial transcriptomics. And we can see uh, visually here at a molecular level, the young ovary looks very different from that old ovary. And what I think the cool, oh, this didn't show up. Oh well. Okay, so what this, this is my favorite slide. Um, but basically, this looked at communication between um, all of the different um, compartments or cell types of the ovary. And what you would have seen is that that stroma or the environment of the ovary is connecting. It's really the hub of communication of all the different cell types in the ovary. And what you can see here is that with age, there's a decrease in that communication of the stroma to these other cell types. And so again, we started with a simple observation with undergraduates in the lab saying it was harder to dissect an old ovary compared to a young ovary. And now at a single cell resolution, we're able to show um, that in fact that environment is truly a hub um, of communication and it's changing with age. So again, the end, if, if you walk away with anything, it's this, that the nest matters, especially when we're thinking about ovarian aging. And so if anything that I said has resonated with you, um, I really invite you to join the reproductive aging ecosystem. 10 years ago, this did not exist. It's a really exciting time to be in this field. Um, I launched the first conference um, in reproductive aging together with uh, Jennifer Garrison and Yushin Su last year. It took place uh, at Palm Springs. But this year, it's in Chicago at the end of the month. So if anyone is interested in learning more and becoming part of this, I encourage you to come. The trainee uh, registration is, is quite reduced um, in terms of cost. And so with that, I will thank all of those in my lab who've done this work. I've highlighted the ones in bold whose work I've talked about, um, as well as all of our collaborators in funding. So thank you very much. So, so uh, great to see some uh, uh, lab uh, bench work can be translated in some uh, clinical applications, right? That give us all uh, the hope that what you're doing now in the lab can be something very important that may affect, you know, change uh, how we uh, prevent diseases and treat diseases in human, and uh, you know, and also prevent aging, which is really <laughs> important. Uh, so we have uh, a little bit time for a few questions, and uh, then we're, you know, uh, then we're going to move on to the closing uh, remarks by uh, Dr. Linda Degutis, and then we're going to have a reception to follow. So uh, let's start with the audience uh, here. Does anyone have a questions for our speaker? Sure, prepare. Um, so I'm not sure if it's maybe way too early in the research to tell, but is there any sort of, I guess, correlation or belief that the use of profinidone um, could potentially reduce the risk of ovarian cancer? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. And, so, and, and your point about is it too early in the research to know? So, you know, part of people people would tell me I'm crazy that you're even trying, like that you're moving towards therapeutics without truly understanding the mechanism of what's causing the fibrosis. But part of me was thinking like, if we wait till that point, like it's gonna be years. And so we don't have that answer, but my prediction would be that that would be the case. And so I think, you know, that is where I see the future going to see whether or not there is a protective effect of reducing that fibrotic environment on the progression of ovarian cancer. But that's also where I would love to be able to use this tool in the clinical setting to be able to say, you know, if you're doing a transvaginal ultrasound, that's not a really invasive technology. So to be able to prospectively follow women and see whether or not those with a higher, you know, stiffer ovary are those that are predisposed to also getting ovarian cancer. But then if we were able to therapeutically intervene, does that prevent that from happening? So certainly we can do it in animal models, but I would like to be able to set the stage to do it in humans as well. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Here. Um, I currently just finished dating ovaries myself, and you were talking about uh, those brown clusters within your ovaries, and I was seeing something like that. Is there any other potential reason that I would see brown clusters besides the multinuclear microphages? Like, how can I rule those out or rule them in? 
So, I mean, you can rule them in because you would stain for a pan macrophage marker like F480, and so they should stain positive. The other thing about these cells is that they're multinucleated, so you'll see multiple nuclei in a cell boundary, and so that would tell you that that's probably that population. Um, in histology, you can get brown, you know, different stains, different stains will pick up sort of different um, different parts of the cellular material. Um, I know like a lot of um, iron, for example, iron deposits will pick up um, that yellow kind of signal. So that would be something else to kind of think about. Can I have you ask the question? I remember seeing your slides. It was yeah. Wrong stain. So it's like, oh, here's the and answer. And also, yeah. yeah, and also like lipofusine, like any sort of accumulation of cellular debris can, can cause with histological stains to, to appear yellow like that. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I guess, so I see that you brought up uh, the different therapeutic uh, um, interventions there and how, how those can um, make a big impact on the aging of the uh, reproductive organs and cells in, the, in, in your studies. Um, and I know we also mentioned like we don't quite yet understand the mechanics by which um, these things progress um, naturally. But I guess uh, my question is, um, what what do we know, I guess, about this at this point? What does this tell us in terms of um, prevention or, um, I, I guess, the slowing of the progression rather than treatment? Um, so, I'm not sure I fully understand but your question, but maybe I can sort of respond to it and see if I get somewhere. So one thing is that, I mean, we certainly know that with age, the, the ovary is becoming fibrotic. What we don't really know is how other impacts. So we, we, have, we actually know obesity um, can cause changes in the fibrotic stiffness. We know like conditions like PCOS can cause this. So what we don't really, so we have evidence that other conditions can lead to this fibrosis. Um, but we don't know sort of holistically what else is contributing to that process. So, you know, where, how prevention could be integrated in those settings. Um, why I think that this is so important is currently the therapeutic sort of options for women are to undergo, for example, egg freezing when they're younger. And with the idea being that you kind of freeze your eggs in that biological time. And so if you're freezing them at age, you know, in your mid twenties, even if you transplant them or fertilize them and, and uh, undergo IVF in your forties, you're still using a, a young egg. The problem with that is that in those conditions is that fertility is not a guarantee, even if you freeze your eggs. You're also um, undergoing IVF and, and embryo transfer in an older individual, which has its own complications. And you're only solving one part of the problem, right? You're solving the fertility aspect, not the endocrine aspect. And so my premise here is that if we can prevent this process from happening by changing the environment, we're not only gonna have happier, healthier eggs longer, but we're also gonna have an intact endocrine system longer. So the solutions right now that exist are very Band-Aid oriented in my mind, and this would actually be solving the root of the problem. So I don't know if that's where you were getting. Um, no, I think I understand. Yeah. Okay, we have a time for two more questions <laughs> and then we will leave the rest to the reception part. Okay, so uh, go ahead. Okay. This um, might be a silly question, but your focus is mostly on the ovaries. Do you ever do stuff on the uterus, like once the egg is released and then attaches, like, and like the um, conalities of that being released and like not attaching to the ball? Yeah, so first of all, there's no stupid question. I will say that most of my best ideas have come from questions in talks like this, and I'm like, oh, I've never thought of that. We should do that. So so thank you for asking that question. Um, I think your point is, you know, is it beyond the ovary? Are there other changes that are happening with age that could also lead to, to problems? And, um, you know, the data I showed you from assisted reproduction, where if you transfer an, an egg from a young individual into an older woman, the, the outcomes are similar to a young woman. So that would tell us that the, the uterus doesn't have as much of an impact in the aging process um, as compared to the egg itself. That being said, there is um, emerging data that there are very clear changes that are happening in the uterus um, with age um, that may be contributing to um, infertility. So I think it's definitely something um, 
really important to look into. And also the fallopian tube is another area that I think has been understudied in the context of aging. It's a really good point. Okay, we have one last question here. Thomas, go ahead. Um, well, I want to kind of want to ask two questions. Um, just the thought of cellular debris or similar thought when it comes to collagen debris. Is there any concern of, I'm not sure how the body um, uh, removes it. Is there, is there any thought to that? And let's say this does work and then we see that uh, ovaries are releasing eggs again. Does this have any impact on how the body expects that eventually there's this change in an LH and FSH surge, so the body now has to go back to uh, releasing eggs as opposed to like seizing. Yeah, so your point, your first point about debris is like super, super important. So, and actually I think is one of the biggest drivers of aging in the ovary. So what you probably don't think about is that every the, we are born with an ex, a huge excess of follicles women are born with a or females are born with a, a huge excess of follicles um and they have three fates they can remain dormant they can activate to grow or they can die and so if you look at a histological section even in a young ovary there's a tremendous amount of death that's happening in that ovary because these follicles are activating, but they're not getting to the ovulatory stage. And so there's a ton of debris that this organ, a young, healthy organ has to deal with. And over time, I think that that debris um, is not being cleared effectively. And so that's what's causing sort of an initial rise in you know, inflammatory cells coming in, trying to get rid of it and just can't keep up with, with everything that's accumulating. So I think your point of debris is really, really important. I think the fact that we have these collagen fibers that are not being degraded are also bringing in immune cells and, and this organ is, it's really a, an issue of clearance. Um, your second point about sort of the having more eggs, is that going to lead to, you know, changes in the, the endocrinology? Um, you know, we, again, we're born with millions of follicles and the, the ovary knows how to release out and activate a certain amount of, you know, we don't understand the mechanisms, but it's certainly um, a certain number. So I, the goal here would be having the follicles la in an environment that lasts longer, but I don't think the endocrine regulation would be different. It would just be extended. Thank you for the great discussion. Well, thank you all. Let's have a round of applause. And a wonderful discussion. And before you return back to your seat, <laughs> so representing the committee, oh, I have this wow. uh, beautiful pack. I'm going to present to you as a token of appreciation for your presentation today. And uh, thank you for being here and for the wonderful talk. It's a thank great you. pleasure to have you here today. This will be. This is definitely the most beautiful thing in my office. <laughs> <laughs> Very fondly. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so finally, we have a keynote address by Dr. Linda Degutis, the sponsor of uh, this uh, uh, lecture series. I know our uh, faculty uh, members and the students and the general public alumni have benefited a lot from this uh, lecture series in the past three years. Uh, it's an annual event. And uh, today we're very fortunate to have a uh, uh, Dr. Linda Degutis to give us the closing uh, remarks, and she won't be able to be here uh, in person. She's in Atlanta, actually, and uh, but she will join us virtually. So uh, Damien will help us to connect with Dr. Degutis. Thanks, Dr. Duncan, for a great talk. It's been really interesting to hear you speak about the work that you've done. And I'd also like to thank you for the work that you do in promoting involvement and engagement in the sciences. I'd also like to thank the committee that has worked on putting this lecture series together and that has done an excellent job of choosing speakers for the series. As you know, Dr. Duncan is the third person to speak in this series. I just can't emphasize enough how seeing scientists like Dr. Duncan would have really meant so much to my dad for whom the series is named. Um, he was not a scientist, nor did he have a college education, but he worked with scientists in his job at the Environmental Protection Agency 
where he worked on water pollution control in the Great Lakes region. One of the reasons that I really felt compelled to do something to recognize his work was that he was so supportive of my interest in science and my education and encouraged me always to learn, to learn more, and to help others learn. Um, he supported me as a child by taking me to the Museum of Science and Industry, to uh, basically allowing my science experiments to continue in the basement of the house, uh, and also to encourage me to read about science, to understand what was going on, and to get a college education. I was, in my family, um, the first to go to college, as many DePaul students are, and I think um, the education at DePaul was extremely valuable in allowing me to pursue a career in which I've been able to both um, do research, do some teaching, but also do things to give back to those who have helped me. And that was a lot of what my father also encouraged. So I'd like to thank the committee. I'd like to thank Dr. Duncan again and really say how much um, we really appreciate your work and the opportunity to hear you speak about it today. So thanks again. I hope you've all enjoyed the lecture and I look forward to the lectures that will occur in the years to come and to your engagement in science. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. DeGutis, for sharing your upbringing, uh, your childhood, and uh, your encouragement by your father, uh, Mr. William uh, DeGutis. Uh, this is a wonderful event, and uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. And uh, uh, again, thank the speaker for the wonderful talk. Uh, we There's a reception outside in the atrium. Uh, in, I, I'd like to invite everybody to join us at the reception and also continue your conversation with the speaker if you have further questions. Uh, and I look forward, and the committee, we all look forward to seeing you again next year for our fourth annual lecture. All right. Bye. -bye.